Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's session. I'm Karen Weisskopf, the Director of Marketing at First Long Island Investors, and I'm joined today by Robert D. Rosenthal, our Chairman, CEO, and Chief Investment Officer, Ralph Pileski, our President and Chief Operating Officer, and Philip Malikoff, Senior Vice President of Wealth Management. We hope that everyone had a great summer. As we approach our 35th anniversary, I wanted to take it this opportunity to thank our clients for their trust all of these years. We look forward to maintaining that trust and continuing to serve you and your families for many more. Before we begin, I will cover a few quick logistical items. One, all participants are currently in listen-only mode. Two, after the team delivers the presentation, we will have time for any questions submitted. You do not need to wait until the end to submit a question. There is a question dialog box Type it there, and it will come immediately to our team. At this point, everyone should see a slide that says today's speakers. If you don't see that, please type something into the chat area, and we'll do our best to troubleshoot. Finally, our general counsel has asked that I remind you, today's session may discuss the performance of some strategies, and past performance is not a guarantee of future results. I now hand it over to Bob. Thank you, Karen, and I wish everyone on this call a very happy end of summer, beginning of fall, and hope your summer was a joyous one. Our quote for today is, look at market fluctuations as your friend rather than your enemy, profit from folly rather than participate in it. A quote from the great investor, great long-term investor, Warren Buffett. Um, we're using this quote for this webinar because we do believe there can and will be more volatility going forward. And as long-term investors, we should try and take advantage of that volatility, not be afraid of it. So please keep Mr. Buffett's words in mind. Our agenda this morning or this afternoon is to discuss what has happened thus far in 2018, key factors, perhaps explain why markets are at record highs, what to watch going forward, potential recession timing, our investment approach for this environment, and then some questions and answers after we have summed up. If you turn to the next slide, it's a very interesting one and a very important chart. It shows that the average GDP growth year over year for the past, past 40 years has been 2.9%. Post the financial crisis, which we've coined the decession, somewhere between a recession and a depression, the GDP growth was only 2.2%, well below the average. The good news is that for the second quarter of this year, we achieved 4.2% GDP growth, which we believe is the result of continuing accommodative monetary policy and the recent introduction of fiscal growth initiatives. Fiscal growth initiatives are based on a change in tax environment, based on the tax bill passed last year, and some deregulation that this administration has introduced. <clears throat> Excuse me. That combined with accommodating monetary policy has permitted our economy to pick up. Obviously, better GDP growth, somewhere trending between three and 4%, as evidenced by this last quarter, is good for business and good for the consumer. But again, we are now accelerating that GDP growth based on fiscal growth initiatives and monetary policy that is still accommodative uh, instead of just relying on monetary policy on steroids with 0% interest rates. So this GDP growth domestically is important and has helped propel um, markets to record highs. If we turn to the next page, you'll see that reflecting an improved economy, interest rates are starting to track up. Now this interesting chart shows that rates are slowly being normalized. They're still very low by historical standards. And markets don't believe the Fed estimates. If you can see uh, the dotted red line, it shows projected FOMC estimates at year end going up to 3.38%. And then you can see the grayish line uh, which suggests that the markets believe that sometime in 2020 uh, we'll hit 2.88%. These are still very low in our opinion. 
And just to give you a contrast, our current 10-year U.S. Treasury yield is about 2.88%. The German 10-year bond is 0.37%. Japan is at 0.11%. And the U.K. is at 1.44%. So despite our rates trending up, which reflects a healthier economy, our 10-year Treasury bond is still well above other domiciles around the world, which makes our bonds very attractive, and in our opinion, should keep a lid on how high our interest rates ultimately go. Keep in mind that higher rates can impact housing, can impact the consumer, can impact business, it also can impact our government that has about $22 trillion in debt. So normalizing rates is healthy, it's something that needed to be done, Thus far, it has not interfered with equity markets, um, and it's a healthy thing. We turn to the next slide. Something that's been in the headlines that's a concern to many of us, but we want to sort of diffuse it, is this concern about a trade war. Now, this chart shows you, if you look at the red circled box, that the United States only has 8% of its GDP in terms of exports. So this is not a significant factor. China is at 14%, the Eurozone is 35%, so trade is far more important to those economies. It matters, but not nearly as much as the media headlines would suggest. Meanwhile, we've negotiated a deal with Mexico that appears to be fair and reasonable. Uh, an, an agreement is being negotiated now with the Canadians and perhaps the Eurozone after that, and maybe even some hope in terms of China. But again, our point in this slide is don't be put off by the media headlines. Um, we don't want to see a trade war, but its impact to the United States as a share of GDP is rather modest and not something that will derail our economy. It could add a bit to inflation if there are tariffs put on some products. But again, to us, this is not a major concern at this point. Now, the next page is critically important. Growing earnings from a stronger economy, from tax reform, and from higher margins, as you see the little chart on the right. These are operating earnings as a percentage of revenue. <clears throat> it shows that American business is making more money from each uh, dollar of revenue that it produces. If you look at the large chart, which is really, really important, it shows that in 2017, corporate earnings started to grow and in 2018, 19, and 20, those projections indicate a very healthy earnings picture. So one may ask why are market averages at record levels? It's simple, it's called earnings. These are legitimate earnings that are critical to valuation in terms of the work that we do and the stocks that you own. Just as a picture of the future, if we were to look at the projected earnings for the Standard & Poor's for 2019, from this chart you'll see it's estimated at 177.24. If we were to divide that by the current level of the S&P 500, which is 28.75, we come to a price earnings multiple projected on next year's earnings at 16.2. Certainly not cheap, but not expensive. By way of contrast, in 2000, when the markets did <clears throat> give in quite a bit and were severely reduced, the P-E ratio on forward earnings was between 28 and 30. So today, if we look forward to a year at 16.2 versus what was greater than 28 back in 2000, it demonstrates that our markets today are not cheap, but they're certainly not nosebleed and not expensive. The key takeaway from this chart is that earnings growth continues. We expect that this year, next year, and the year after. And as you can see, the margin of earnings is also accelerating or holding at a high level. So the underpinning to valuation, in our opinion, are earnings. Earnings are strong. They remain strong. They're getting stronger. And it's not just because of tax reform. It's a combination of that tax reform higher margins, and an economy that's growing now at a greater pace. 
So this is a critical page for the work that we do and to give you confidence that markets are not too high at this point. They're reflecting very significantly growing earnings. And the next page shows, or the next slide shows that as well. Here is the, a chart of the S&P index from January 3rd of 2007. And the reason we go back this 10 year <coughs> excuse me, period is because it shows that there are decreases, that there is volatility, but the long-term trend suggests stay the course despite volatility. We all remember those tough, terrible days in 2008, beginning of 2009, and that's reflected by this downturn in the S&P index. However, if one stayed the course, one has made a considerable amount of money investing over the long term. <clears throat> and again, I emphasize that we're long-term investors and you should be long-term investors and not be shaken out by volatility or even for that matter, periodic recessions, which we'll get to later. Again, I wanna emphasize that at this point, we believe the markets are trading somewhere between 16 and 17 times next year's earnings. A 10-year treasury today is 2.88. To contrast that with 2000, when the market traded at 28 times earnings, the 10-year treasury at that point was well over 5%. So you had a real viable alternative. Today, the combination of 16.2 on next year's earnings and 288 <clears throat> makes the equity markets very attractive still versus bonds. So again, there's a reason why markets have been strong. It's earnings growth and low interest rates, in our opinion. Now, what should we be watching going forward? This chart on the left shows unemployment. Now, we've all read and heard that unemployment is very low, and it is, approximately 3.9%. The long-term average is closer to 6%. So this chart reflects a very strong economy. Now that could be a cause for inflation and wages going up, but if you look at the chart on the right, the long-term average for increased wages is 4.2%, and we're still well below that. Tax reform has attempted to help those folks out that are not getting the raises that perhaps they would like, uh, but we'll have to wait and see whether or not that uh, really delivers what is needed. This is a cause for inflation potentially going forward. Again, with a very low unemployment rate, <clears throat> excuse me, it does normally lead to um, higher wage growth. Another concern to watch going forward, although it's not a major concern, is the higher cost of crude oil, West Texas Intermediate. It's below where it was four years ago, but the trend is higher. This has offset some of the tax savings from the recent tax bill. Part of the reason for this increase is a stronger economy, and part of it is some of the geopolitical concerns that we'll talk about later. The sanctions on Iran will curtail supply to some extent, so that and the hot spots in the Middle East are contributing to a, a somewhat more speculative oil market, which is leading to somewhat of a higher cost per barrel, but again, still well below where it was four years ago. <clears throat> this next slide talks about inflation, and it shows the trend is higher. Now, history, at least our view of history and our studying of history, shows that markets can prosper in rising rate environments as long as rates don't spike. Higher inflation normally means somewhat higher interest rates. The Fed normalizing rates based on a stronger economy is reflected in this chart. So we have inflation going up following somewhat higher interest rates. And again, we watch inflation very carefully and we watch in interest rate increases very carefully. Again, we've studied this and in recent periods of time, equity markets have prospered even when both inflation and interest rates modestly go up as long as they don't spike. So again, inflation is always in our view as a concern, but it is not at any level where we are concerned today and some businesses actually like a bit of inflation. So this is also something to watch. And with that, I'll turn it over to my partner, Phil Malico. Thanks, Bob. Um, so on the next slide, you'll see another important factor to pay attention to, and that's business capital expenditures, or CapEx. So after peaking in early 2015, CapEx spending is back on the rise. And we believe this is due to a number of factors, the first of which, is the loosening of business regulations by the current administration, 
which has made it a goal to support a pro-business, pro-growth agenda. This has led to increasing business confidence. The NFIB Business Optimism Index is at its second highest reading of all time and the highest in 35 years. With more certainty and confidence in the business climate, companies have been more enthusiastic about spending on projects. Tax legislation passed earlier this year is another important factor, as this legislation lowered corporate tax rates to 21% from as high as 35%, providing companies with more cash to pursue these projects. Additionally, the new tax legislation allows for the repatriation of assets which are invested overseas at an 8% tax rate, once again providing large corporations with a means of raising ample cash. The new law also allows for any spending on capital expenditures to be depreciated or expensed immediately instead of over the useful life of the asset, which could be many years. This will provide a tax benefit to companies as it will lower net income immediately in the year the spending is incurred and lower taxes equate to, to lower cash expenses. So now that we understand why CapEx is rising, we should discuss why this is a good thing for the economy. Quite simply, more capital expenditures or spending means more money flowing through our economy. This helps drive money velocity, it means more jobs, more efficiencies, improved productivity, and the lowering of inflationary effects. Well, obviously, all of these are positives for the economy. Volatility is another important factor that we watch closely. The chart you're looking at shows the actual number of days when there was a greater than 1% range in the S&P 500 index. The average over the last 25 years is 124 days, a figure which hasn't been reached in, well, since 2011. Last year, we experienced historically low volatility by this measure with only 10 such days well under the average and also well under the previous annual low, which was 40 days. This year, volatility has increased a bit with 60 such days through the end of August. Increases in volatility tend to occur when there are dislocations or shakeouts in the market. One such occurrence happened earlier this year, and we can see that reflected in the, the chart on the next uh, slide. Thank you. Um, so this two-year chart shows the CBOE market volatility index, which is also known as the VIX. It confirms that volatility was restrained last year, never rising above the 16 level, spending most of the year in the 9 to 12 range. And, you know, volatility in a high single digits, that's a historic low. Um, however, in late January and early February of this year, the VIX spiked to almost 40 and traded north of 20, for most of the next few months as equity prices retreated, rallied, pulled back again. There was obviously a lot going on. Um, but as equities subsequently rallied through the summer, volatility returned back to the low levels that experienced for much of last year. So going forward, we expect the investment markets will experience bouts of heightened volatility. And while many newer investors have only experienced increasing volatility with equity market sell-offs, those of us who are investing in the late 90s remember when volatility was high as equity markets were soaring. So it can work both ways. Another important factor to watch are the midterm elections, uh, which are happening later this year. And the slide on this page shows how equity markets perform both following midterm elections as well as how they tend to correct leading up to these elections. In each midterm election year, the market has advanced by a minimum of 9% in the year following the elections, with an average return of 31%. So why is this? We believe that coming into these important periods, there is uncertainty. Who's going to win? What incumbent will lose? Which party will gain seats? Will the House or Senate have a change in control? Will Congress align with the party in control of the White House? Equity markets don't like uncertainty. And this is shown in the market drawdowns that happen as we approach each of these elections. The average correction for midterm election years is 19%. And earlier this year, we experienced a 10% pullback. However, <coughs> once elections are decided, there is certainty. And investors feel more confident about the direction of public policy going forward. 
political certainty is typically rewarded with higher equity prices. You may recall that equity prices were sliding lower as we approached the most recent presidential election. But once the election was over, a new president elected, equities advanced strongly, gaining over 20% in the next 12 months. The cycle has been repeated over and over again, but that being said, history is a guide. It is not a guarantee. So, um, <clears throat> one sign that a recession may be on the horizon is an inverted yield curve particularly when the two-year treasury is at a higher rate than the 10-year treasury. History tells us that on average, the U.S. will enter a recession about 18 months after this happens. This chart shows a year in 2013, as shown by the light blue line, the curve was a bit steep and upward sloping. Since then, numerous interest rate raises by the Fed have pushed up short-term rates, while continued buying of our longer-dated treasuries by foreigners and low inflation expectations have lowered longer term rates, leading to a much flatter yield curve that we are experiencing now. You can see that with the dark blue line. But while term spreads have narrowed, the curve is not yet inverted. The bottom chart on the page shows the spread between the two year treasury and the 10 year treasury. The spread is certainly constricted, but as of September 4th, it was still at 20 basis points, or 0.2%, not inverted. As of this morning, it's 25 basis points. Should mention there is history for this spread remaining near inversion, but not becoming inverted. Beginning in late 1994, the spread broke the 60 basis point level and quickly <coughs> went to nine basis points at year end. It subsequently moved higher, and for most of the next three and a half years was under 60 basis points before finally inverting in May of 1998. For reference, the twos 10 spread broke the 60 basis point level late last year. A number of well-known market strategists and policymakers have been writing that the twos 10 spread may no longer be the best indicator to forecast a recession. Wharton finance professor and CNBC contributor Jeremy Siegel recently made the argument that the proper short-term maturity to use in this analysis is the 90-day Treasury bill, saying that two years is not quote-unquote really short term. The spread between the 90 day and 10 year is currently 75 basis points, not yet close to inverting. Siegel goes on to say that people are comparing current <laughs> spreads to the averages in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, which were much higher inflation and interest rate periods, making the twos tens comparison less relevant today. The Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco in a paper published earlier this year also recognizes the historically low interest rates as a difference maker. And Goldman Sachs published a research piece in late August, which concluded that current term spreads do not currently indicate heightened recession risk and that they are skeptical that the slope of the yield curve adds much to this economic perspective. So in conclusion, we're we, can, we continue to closely monitor the shape of the yield curve, but we are expanding our analysis to include numerous term spreads as well as the absolute level of interest rates. Okay. Go to the next one, thank you. Um, so we keep hearing and reading that the economic recovery is, is long in the tooth, but it's our belief and observation that recoveries don't end because of old age. The end because the pace of growth is too strong, leading to inflation, and the end is higher interest rates used to combat inflation, suffocate the ability for businesses to grow and expand. The current recovery has now reached nine years, but as you can see in the slide, the recovery has been the weakest in 70 years. Years of the economy grinding along at one, one and a half, two percent growth have prevented it from gaining any momentum, keeping inflation subdued and interest rates near historical lows. Since the end of the prior peak, which occurred in the fourth quarter of 2007, the economy has experienced cumulative real GDP growth of only about 15%. And that's shown by the dark blue line towards the bottom of this chart. This significantly trails other recovery cycles, which reach cumulative 20% growth in much shorter time frames. And in fact, three recoveries surpassed 30% growth, and one even exceeded 50%. Based on the weakness of the cycle, the longevity of the economic recovery may exceed all prior recoveries 
and based on previous experience will not end until it reaches the 20% growth level at a minimum. <clears throat> so as long as the economy continues to expand, equity markets should as well. On, on this slide is our checklist of nine items that occurred prior to the two most recent stock market corrections, which began in 2000 and 2007. During both of these periods, all nine items were occurring, earning check marks, but today, none of them are. Looking down this list, we've already discussed rising real interest rates and widening credit spreads. Most of the other factors are just not happening or even close to happening, which indicates to us that the market will continue to show resilience. Take, for example, the second point, heavy inflows into equity market funds. This is something the markets haven't experienced in quite a long time, and currently more money for some reason, is flowing into the bond market than the equity markets. This is not a sign of an equity market top. And the other points on the slide agree with this observation. I'd now like to introduce our president, Ralph Pileski, who will discuss our investment approach. Thank you, Phil. Uh, as, as Bob and Phil are taking you through the, the economics and the current environment, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes in the next couple of slides on our current investment approach. And most of you are familiar with this particular slide, which is our roadmap in terms of how we think. Uh, we are currently, uh, we've always had security investments, defensive strategies, traditional equities, and then private investments. And I want to concentrate on the first three. Uh, currently, we're underweight uh, fixed income with a focus on quality. And I'll get into that on the next slide. We are overweight our defensive strategies because when you have a market that's been straight up for nine years, I think being a little prudent and overweighting your defensive strategies makes a lot of sense, even though the defensive strategies have performed extremely well. The traditional, we're underweight our traditional equities, as you can see from this slide. So let me take you through the next slide, which is the fixed income. The reason we're underweight fixed income is when you look at the current inflation rate of 2.4%, which is shown by the red line going across the top, and all, all of this is net of federal tax. If you look at the returns of five-year treasuries, 10-year treasuries, five-year tax-free municipals, and even an S&P investment-grade corporate bond, you're not really getting paid, number one, to go out further on the scale and you're not getting paid in terms of yield. So that's one of the reasons we're underweight fixed income. If you look at the next slide, which shows compounding returns, and we looked at a 90-day U.S. Treasury, which is the green line. We looked at the S&P 500, which is the red line. And then the purple line is a 10-year Treasury. And we look, if you invested a million dollars back in 1997, so over a 20-year period of time, the million would have been about a million four seventy-three if it, you just kept it in 90-day T-bills. It would have been about 2.4 million if you put it in a 10-year Treasury. And if you look at what the S&P has done over that time, even with the dip in 2008, we're at 4.1 million. So the effective compounding really shows here. On the, uh, our current approach on a, our defensive basket is designed to do two, three things. Mitigate volatility, minim minimize the downside capture, and then capture a significant portion of the market appreciation. Some examples of that would be hedge growth, which is a bias to growth companies, dividend growth, which is a bias to value companies, multi-strategy hedged investments, which is a bias to credit. The reason that we're maintaining an allocation to traditional equities can be seen on the next slide. If you look at the current PEs versus a 20-year average, and you look at the left side of the equation on value and the right side on growth, the, you can see that the current PEs are, for a large cap value, 14.2% versus 13.8. So there's really not a big difference in terms of valuation there. Same thing in mid-cap 
same thing in small cap. Over on the growth side, you're looking at a 21 PE uh, versus a traditional 19.7 for a 20 year average. Same thing on mid cap. Where it's a little but it is on the small cap side, where the small caps have run from a uh, current PE of 38 to a traditional 20 year average of 28. So you could be a little cautious on the, on the small cap side. Our current approach and, and the current thinking um, is to always maintain an allocation of traditional equities with a modest bias to growth companies. And it's as demonstrated on this chart going back to 2007, you can see what the international arenas have done in that period of time. When you look at the All World Index and the uh, EFA, which are the bottom two, returning 16 and 18 percent. The Russell 1000 value has returned about 106, and the S&P has returned 148, whereas the growth has 202. So that's the reason that we've, over time, always maintained a bias toward growth companies. One of the things that we believed in going back 35 years when we founded the company was the power of compounding. And this chart will really demonstrate over long periods of time the effect of compounding. If you look at a one-year analysis, you can see that cash has really yielded practically nothing. Bonds have been negative. And if you spend that out over five years, 10 years, and 20 years, you can see that there is absolutely no question that the best place that you should have been was in stocks. So this dramatically demonstrates what we've always believed in is if, if you invest in high quality businesses with extremely good cash flows at reasonable prices, you will make a lot of money. So I'm going to turn it back to Bob now who's going to summarize uh, for everybody. Thanks, Ralph. Through August 31st, 2018 has been a year with solid gains for our strategies. We are cautiously optimistic that the rest of 2018 will continue in the same fashion. U.S. GDP and corporate earnings will both continue to grow, supporting businesses, consumers, and equity markets. And I think our slides have suggested why and where they're going to continue to grow. Companies will continue to reap and reinvest the benefits of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. It's just the beginning. And the work that we have done demonstrates that companies are beginning to put those monies to work and make investments for the future, which gives us confidence that continued GDP growth and earnings growth will continue. Most valuations are not stretched, but stock selection still and always remains key. Volatility will continue likely throughout 2018 and may pick up especially given the current domestic and geopolitical headlines, especially as we get closer to the midterm elections. Concentrated portfolios of companies with strong fundamentals should prove successful over the long term. We believe concentrated portfolios for you represent our best ideas, not so much diversification that it becomes a diversification. We remain committed to selective opportunities in real estate and private equity, and we'll bring them to you as they come across our desks and we vet them. <clears throat> we believe a prudent asset allocation with an overweight to defensive strategies is the best course for most investors in the current environment. And let me remind you that we review every client's asset allocation on a quarterly basis and recommend changes where needed. And that concludes our summary, and I turn it back to Karen now to field any questions. Great. So thank you so much for sharing all of this, Bob, Phil, and Ralph. We'll now begin with questions. I'm going to start with a question that was sent in in advance, but please type your questions and we'll get to as many as possible. So we received a question asking if can stock prices continue to rise while the Fed is tightening on rates. And I'm going to let 
um, a member of our investment committee, Ed Kolesky, take that one. Thank you, Karen. As my uh, colleague Phil stated, history is a guide, not a guarantee. Uh, but in our opinion, yes, indeed, history has shown equity bull markets can continue on during a Fed tightening cycle, especially in the early to mid stages of the cycle. Uh, monetary tightening typically co coincides with periods of solid economic growth and strong growth in corporate profits and earnings, which more than offset the impact of higher rates, at least in the short term. However, once the Fed adopts a more aggressive monetary tightening cycle, uh, typically due to a sudden rise in inflation, this could lead to a potential reversal in stock prices. <coughs> The Fed deliberately attempts to cool an overheating economy, leading to a slowdown in economic and corporate profit growth. At the present time, the Fed's tightening cycle is not a meaningful threat to the equity market for two main reasons. First, uh, the Fed has absolutely no intention of slowing the growth rate of the U.S. economy. Rather, the purpose of the current tightening is to normalize interest rates. The Fed is intent on restoring rates to levels that existed prior to the 2008 financial crisis. Second, the tightening cycle began from a period of monetary accommodation, meaning the current level of rates are still well below normal. Until there is a sustained rise in wage and price inflation, the Fed will continue to raise rates at a slow and accommodated pace. Thus, we believe the prospects for investment returns over the next several years are encouraging. Thank you, Karen. Great. Thanks, Ed. Hopefully that helps give some people some comfort. Um, another question we got is, do we have any perspective or insight on how the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will impact real estate as an investment? Sure, I'll try and take that, Karen. Um, interestingly enough, <laughs> the one provision of the tax law change is that you can still swap or do a tax-free exchange on real estate, whereas collectibles such as art, no longer can you do the, the 1031 exchange. So without a question, the tax bill, to some extent, has favored real estate investing and permits real estate investors, developers, to continue to uh, sell, but sell through a tax-free exchange, <clears throat> which is not available to owners of stocks um, or paintings or other collectibles. Um, there are other provisions within the tax law that also favor real estate uh, relating to depreciation and other factors. So I think that the, um, the tax writers, uh, Congress, recognize the importance of real estate development to the general economy and preserve some features in the tax bill that still encourage real estate investing. Uh, but any for further answer on that, or to delve deeper, I'd have to bring in our Chief Financial and Tax Officer, Steve Juca. Great. Okay. I think that that is the, the questions for today. So we appreciate everyone's time. I want to thank the team for delivering the presentation. Thank everyone for dialing in. Um, if you have any other questions on anything we share today or your individual, your individual asset allocation, Members of the investment committee are always available. Please call us, schedule a time for us to come visit you or you to come visit us. Um, we hope everybody has a great rest of the day and we'll speak to all of you soon.